Uh, hello, uh, welcome to Robotics 102, uh, Introduction to AI and Programming. Uh, I am Professor Chad Jenkins. Welcome to my next lecture, uh, which is gonna be about branching and, branching and iteration. And so this is really about getting us up to speed on C++ so that we can write programs and make robots do things. And as we're coming up, we're gonna have a robot do wall following. And so we need to get up our C++ literacy uh, to do this. But we also wanna start to understand um, how we can represent computation um, in models that allow us to talk about the behavior of our programs. And so one thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this in terms of a, what we call a finite state machine. And so I'm just showing one here for, for an example that I'm very familiar with, which is uh, the way that Mario changes throughout the game Super Mario Brothers. And so, um, and so this is inspired by, uh, by, uh, by something I found on the internet when I was looking for, about looking up finite state machines. And so, so on Mario Wiki, there is, uh, there's, there's this great picture that shows how Mario, the state of Mario can change depending on which objects he comes uh, or which items he comes in, in contact with. And so you can have Mario, if it gets the mushroom becomes Super Mario. Um, and, from, and if Mario or Super Mario touches the flower, they can become Fire Mario. Uh, or if, they touch, if it touches the feather, it becomes the cape. And so this gives a, this really is representing, um, you know, the different, the behavior of Mario throughout the, the game, how he changes his state. Um, and so finite state machines are great for expressing this. So if you're asking yourself what a finite state machine is, it's a model of computation, an abstracted model of computation that describes the, beha the behavior of a system. And so, uh, and so what we're seeing here is that uh, a finite state machine can be expressed visually as a state diagram. So this is this state diagram shows how Mario can can change over time. And this is this represents what a finite the finite state machine for his uh, for his his evolution over time. Um, and this and the structure that's underlying this is, is what we call a graph. And a graph has both nodes and edges in it. And really is a is a general model of computation. You'll see it all around all around um, artificial intelligence, robotics. Uh, and it really talks about how we how we describe computational systems, and so you know so I so taking this I let's let's try to break this down a little bit further and say that you know that our state machine here is is represented as a graph, and so this is a graph that we're seeing right here um, that of graphs of nodes and edges, and so what is a node? What is an edge? Well, a node. Each of these circles rep represents a node. Um, and so, so that's typically, so these, the node, you can think of it as, as some sort of state or some sort of, so some sort of entity where we can ascribe certain information to it. So there might be a name that's, that's associated with this. So, so we, each of these states have a, have a name. We have Mario, Super Mario, Star Super Mario, Fire Mario, Star Mario, and I'm, I just call this one less Mario. And so these are the states that, that Mario could be in. And, um, and, uh, and you, there also might be a, a visual description to it. So there might be a sprite that we have. So these, these, little, these little icons represent sprites. Um, there might be other things that we, that we ascribe to Mario, but we're just gonna take these. And so those, those nodes hold information that are relevant to us. And then edges represents how the, system, how the system state changes. So for instance, if we took Mario, so we just have regular Mario, depending on which object he comes in contact with. So if he, he comes in contact with the mushroom, he becomes Super Mario and changes state from just regular Mario to Super Mario. If he touches the, the flower, he goes from regular Mario to being Fire Mario. If he touches the star, he becomes, uh, he becomes uh, Star Mario. And if he touches that, that, uh, that, um, that enemy the wrong way, then he'll be one less Mario. And so, so that really talks about how our system changes. Edges describe those changes. We should note that edges are directional. This means that that that, that it's not just sort of you know uh, that that the that the cause just happens in, in in the same direction both ways. So, for instance, if we had Mario, and he and he he touches the the um, the, uh, the mushroom, he turns into Super Mario. But if he touches that mushroom again, he doesn't turn back into regular Mario. He stays Super Mario. Um, but and so, in order for him to go back from from being Super Mario. To being Mario, he has to be. Uh, he has to. He has to touch an enemy the wrong way, or has to be. Be, uh, you know, has to be attacked by an enemy. And so these edges are directional. Their behavior depends on their direction. 
And so if we put all of this together, this represents, you know, the, you know, my son and I, my son who, who really plays a lot of Mario, he makes his own levels in, 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 in Mario Brothers, it's all over the place. We sat together and we said, this is, this is a reasonable representation. Now it doesn't cover everything, but, but this is a, a reasonable representation of the finite state machine describing Mario's behavior in, um, in, the, in the first one, the first Super Mario Brothers for the, for the 8-bit Nintendo, the, thing, the game that I loved in the, in the 80s that, uh, that was just mind-blowing for me. And so these finite machines, finite state machines don't just describe Mario's behavior, but can be, just, be used to describe the behavior of any program, uh, or I should say a variety of different programs. It depends on, on the class of, of computation you're talking about. But, uh, but we can use this, so, so the question is, if we have uh, a Mario state diagram here that describes his behavior, can we have a finite state machine that describes what our pocket calculator looks like at the current time? And so, uh, and so this is really, uh, the, you know, this is, um, this is one thing we're gonna try to do next. Sorry, I have Slack messages. I forgot to turn notifications off, so Slack messages are going on in the background. Forgive me for that. Um, all right, so, so if we wanna to start to think about what a finite state machine will look like uh, for, our, for our current calculator, we should go back and ask, what was this code doing, right? What, what, what was going on underneath, underneath this code to produce the behavior that we're seeing here where, where we ask for two numbers and then uh, perform, uh, perform our arithmetic operations on those numbers and then output those to the screen. And so when we look at that, we can go back to our code and we took our, we have our code is, is nicely lined up into just four function calls. And those four function calls give us a structure and organization that we can turn into a finite state machine. So the first thing we do is we ask for two numbers. So we, we call this function get number twice to get one number and then get another number. Then we're going, to we're going to take those two numbers and we're going to perform all our arithmetic operations on them to get their sum, their difference, their product, and their quotient. And then we're going to output the results to the screen and that's going to produce the, the behavior that you see here. And so if we took this and we turned it into a fine, we took this, this, this flow of computation, the behavior of our system, we could think of this as, um, as basically we, we're our, syst, our, our program starts in the state where it has to get a number, then user input comes in, then we get another number, user input comes in, then for both of those, we perform the operations, then we, and we use that to store the result that will change us to a new state where we output results, then we print the result, and then we end the program. And so this finite state machine describes the flow, the, the behavior of our program. But our pocket calculator is going to look very different. And so what is the state machine, you know, and so the way it performs, it's just any pocket calculator has a very different form of computation uh, or, or the structure of the computation, which will look different in terms of a, a state machine. We typically call a, a finite state machine an FSM, uh, just for short, just an acronym, finite state machine. What would the finite state machine for, for a regular pop, pocket calculator look like? And so to, to lay that out, let's go through, uh, go through our example here. So let's go open up the calculator again. And, uh, and let's just start off by just doing uh, three times four. So I'm gonna click three times four on the calculator here and, uh, and I get 12, right? Um, and so if I, if I do this and break it down into what, what it's looked like for our, for our, um, for our, in, our, in terms of a finite state machine, just up to this point, we've got a number, we, our user input was three. We, um, we, um, we got an operation so we didn't do that with our calculator, but we get an we get an operation. All right, that's the reminder that I have to turn notifications off. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, and so we got we're gonna get an operation, which is gonna be our our multiplication, um, and then we're gonna get a number, which is gonna give a which we inputted four. Then we perform the multiplication, which produces twelve. That result gets stored and then output to the screen. And then what the pocket calculator does, it does not end at that point, it waits. And so, uh, that, so, so after the result is printed, it waits for the, for the next operation. And so this looks very, this will look very different. So, so it's not unlike the calculator we have now, it's clear that we're gonna have to make some changes to our current calculator. One thing we should note is that, um, is that, that 12 uh, now becomes, uh, becomes our next uh, our, our, our next, uh, we're going to start to work with that 12, and then we're going to get another operation, 
And then from that, we're going to get another number and then we're going to print, we're going to output that result. And so we, now we have the, we have 12 plus eight equals 20. And so there's a couple of things that we should note in this next command that we've given in that, um, in that the result of the first operation, the, the output of that becomes the operand for the second operation. And so what we're doing here is not just, not just waiting that we, in terms of getting the output result, we're actually looping back. And so after we print the result, we go back and get the next operation. And that creates a loop in our finite state machine. And that loop will essentially continue forever and ever and ever because we'll just continue to, um, at this point, continue to get operation, get the next number, apply that to our, our previous, uh, the result of our previous operation. And that happens over and over and over. And so that's what we're gonna see. We should also note that what happened is that the user chose addition instead of multiplication. So we're not just gonna perform a multiply here. We're actually gonna do what's called, uh, what, what's, what we're gonna call it, it's called a branch. And so based on what operation we have, the current operator, we're gonna either perform addition or multiplication based off of, off of that, that, that chosen operator. So, we're, so this branch is gonna be, it's not just doing the same thing over and over, but our program is gonna have to make a decision about what operation to perform. Similarly, uh, so, as, so continuing on, uh, now we're gonna take the result of this operation and we're gonna, um, we're going to, uh, to, uh, to perform an operation, uh, uh, perform the next operation. This is gonna be a subtraction. We're gonna subtract 10 from 20 um, and then we get 10 out. And so, uh, so from there, we should note that in general, what's gonna happen is, is that the result of the current operation will become the first operand for the next operation. And so we're looping over and over and over again. And this is gonna be, this will be the relationship between our iterations. We also perform a subtraction. So that gives us another branch that, that's in our finite state machine uh, for, for subtraction. Now our next one is gonna, we're gonna take the result that we're gonna take that 10 that resulted. We're gonna this time divide by five and we'll get two. And so now we've, we've done all of our arithmetic operations. So these are the branches that, we're, that we should be expecting to see. And this, this looks like the finite state machine that we're gonna carry out all the way through uh, the remainder of the calculation. And so after this, we'll take the two. Now we're gonna multiply by, by 51. And our answer is 102, great number. Um, and so now we're gonna take that 102. We're gonna subtract by negative 265. Um, so we should note that we get that in this case, that will essentially perform an addition. Um, and that will send, then we get 367, another good number. We should note up to this point that all we've done are integer operations. And so we have the integer data type that can, that can handle this for us. Uh, but we should also note that our calculator doesn't just work with integers. If we, let's say, added, a, if we wanted to, uh, to add a, a floating point number in, so, so this is a real number. Um, and so, we, so this time we have 100.5, um, which, is, which, is, uh, which is a floating point number on the real number line. Uh, we can add the integer to the, to the float. And that will give us, uh, that will give us uh, now uh, a real number. And our, our calculator has to be able to handle that as we've discussed previously. We can continue on and then, uh, and then we can perform more, more floating point operations. So the 465, we can multiply it by, by, um, by 0 0.5, which will essentially be like dividing it by two. And we get that division by two. And, um, and we can work with increasingly higher precision numbers. And so, uh, so now if I subtracted this, this number by, by this longer number, you know, 131.5526, which, uh, which is a long number, I will, I will end up with, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a more, with a higher precision number as we go further along. And so this will continue and our calculator will do this forever. And so, uh, so for comparing these two, what our calculator looks like uh, which are the finite state, state machine we have up here versus what, we, what a real pocket calculator is going to do, which is the finite state machine you see on the bottom. You note that we've got some things here that are, that are very different. And there's, there's some important concepts that's gonna, that, that we need to be able to, to, to understand in order to get from where we are at the current calculator to a real pocket calculator. And so the question is, how do we code up this, this, uh, 
this fine this finite state machine in C++. Well, there's a couple of things that we're going to have to add to our current knowledge. Uh, first is we're going to have to we're going to have to figure out how to do branching, and that is when a program chooses one of two or more execution options uh, based off of its current state. And so, based off of which operator we're given by the user, we're going to have to choose which operation to to perform. We can't just perform all of them and just be like, "All right, this is everything. Now you choose." No, we have to choose as the as the as the program. Um, and similarly, we have to figure out how to do iteration. That is, we can't just let things run and then just you know do more and more. It, it just uh, you know perform more and more operations. We actually want to want to keep the same operations, but then repeatedly do them over and over and over. And so, iteration is when a program repeatedly executes or loops over a segment of code until some condition is met. And so, uh, so, so these two concepts are really what's next on our, on our list here. Um, so if we think about where we've gone thus far, we've been able to talk about how we, can build, how we can build a program structure in C++, compile and execute it. We've talked about the different types of operators, arithmetic operators, compare uh, arithmetic operators and, um, and assignment operators and the different data types we can use and how that's expressed as variables and getting user input and output from, um, uh, from, the, from the terminal, from the console. And last time we talked about functions that help us modularize our, our the code. Um, with branching and iteration that we build on top of that, we will be able to get a working calculator. So I'm just showing the, the output of what this looks like right here. And so this working calculator, so branching and iteration is what's gonna, what's gonna allow us to do this. And then after that, I'll talk about uh, some things that we can do with vectors and structs and file IO that allow us to do even more, but branching iteration are really core concepts. And so with that, um, because this is a AI and programming course, uh, let's write our first, first artificially intelligent program. And, uh, and the mantra for this, our, 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 you know, the, 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 um, the theme of this is that I branch, therefore I am. <laughs> so, uh, so with this in mind, um, I branched, therefore I am. I wrote this, uh, this code. This is I think dot, uh, dot CPP. And so, um, and so really what we have here is, is, you know, it's very much like our hello world program from before. Um, you know, all it's doing is printing out, therefore I am. Um, but we, but, but you should note that I have a variable here and this is the amount that I am thinking. So I, so how much I am thinking and I initialize this variable, uh, it's equal to one. And then I have this statement here, this if statement. And that if statement uh, basically is looking at the, at, the, at the variable and deciding that if that variable is greater than zero, then I can execute this statement. Um, and so, so there's, a, there's a decision that's being made. The, the, the program is making a choice, um, but whether to print the statement out or not. So if I change the, the amount that I'm thinking to zero, um, then what's going to happen when I run the program, it's going to say, well, no, I'm going it's not, it's not going to, it's not actually going to print that out. So this is the execution that happens here. And so, so, um, so it is, so we get non-existent, non-existent output in that case. Um, and so this if statement is really, you know, really starts to give us, uh, gives us, you know, gives our ability, our program, the ability to, to make decisions about what, wh whether to do something or whether not to do something. Um, and so this is this if statement is the core of what we of 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 what we do for for having our program branch. Um, and so what happens in this case? So the the way an if the, the way if statement is structured is that we start with uh, with the um, with the with with, with the, the branching statement starts with the word if, um, which is a reserved word we should remember. And then um, and then there's a branching condition that's inside parentheses that follows this word. And that branching condition will evaluate to a Boolean, which means that it either, it, it either will be true or false. And if that condition is true, then we're gonna execute the code that's inside of the, the net. We're gonna, execute this, we're gonna execute this next block of code. So if this is true, we're gonna execute the statement here or whatever statements, uh, set of statements is gonna be inside of, in between these, uh, these delimited braces. If the state, if that, if the condition evaluates the false, then we're going to skip that next block of code, and then we're going to start executing from the from the statement that from from the put from the point that's just after that. So, um, and so for false, we're going to then just move on to the to the next statement. And so, if we looked at at this and we said, 
Well, if we just looked at this code right here, it's a slight modification on, on, on what we had before. Um, we should note that if, if thinking amount is greater than zero, which, is, which, is, which would make this, this condition true, then we're gonna output therefore I am, which is inside of the braces. Uh, and then we're also gonna keep continue and output the next statement. But if our condition is false, our thinking amount is zero or less, then, um, then, our, then we're only gonna get to the next statement and we'll skip the therefore I am. And so that is the basics of how the if statement works. Now we could also say, well, what if we didn't want to, you know, we, what if we didn't want to, to necessarily, you know, have both, if the condition is false to, to um, or the condition is true, we don't want to necessarily, you know, continue, we want to have uh, another case where we can, where we can print out something that's different, right? Um, and so, you know, so there can be, you know, you know, if we did, if this is true, then do this thing. If, if it's not true, then do this other thing, else do this other thing. And so an if else statement allows us to do this. So similar to our if statement, which is gonna be at the top, we're gonna still have a, have a branching condition. If the branching condition is true, we're gonna execute that statement. But if the branching condition is false, then we're gonna execute this else block of code, which is gonna, in this case, say, don't worry, be happy. And so this is going to, this is really our, uh, so this is the structure of an if else statement, just a slight modification, but, uh, but it gives us the power to decide whether we want to do this or that. We should note that these branching conditions, so again, these conditions evaluate to either true or false. The, the condition typically involves a comparison of two values. And so C++ has a number of operators to, to compare two values. And so these come, uh, these, these largely come from, 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 uh, from our, our arithmetic, you remember? So we have less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, equal and not equal. Um, and so this is probably, it's probably best to consider this with some, with, with some examples. And so, uh, so let's just start with, uh, with a few of these. Um, so is, is, so if we have this condition, 102 is less than 101, would this evaluate the true or false? So think about it for a second, take a sip of coffee while you think about it. All right. Um, it should be pretty obvious that, uh, that, um, that this is going to be false. So 102 is, is definitely not less than 101. And so in that condition, we'd have a, we, it would evaluate the false. Um, but let's say we had 102 is less than or equal to um, 101 plus one. Um, would this be, would this evaluate the true or false? Another sip of coffee. All right, hopefully basic, basic math hasn't failed you again. And we know that this is this is true, right? Um, how about something a little bit a little bit different? Let's just not do numbers. Let's do characters. Is C the character C not equal to the character um, to the to the character for the plus sign? Um, well, in this case, uh, this would be true, and and so we know that these these aren't the same. And we should note that the, these comparison operators work with all basic. Uh, C++ data types. It's not just numbers, right? Um, and so, you know, and, and there, there, you can get a little complicated when you're starting to think about things that, that aren't numbers and less than or equal to and, and things like that. But, you know, but they're, they will work and you'll have, well, you have to, we'd have to discuss more about the logic between them, but, but, but they'll work. They will evaluate to either true or false. Um, so similarly, let's, let's ask, uh, you know, is, is C, uh, is the character C, equal to the, to the plus sign, um, it should be pretty obvious that that's false. These are not the same thing. But what happens when we have, we have a condition with, that requires multiple comparisons? So let's say I wanted, you know, in order for, for my if statement to work, I, I wanted to, um, to say whether 100, you know, we have this condition from before, which I know is, which is true, and this other condition, which evaluates the false, how do I combine them together? Let's say I, I didn't really care, you know, which one was true, but I just wanted at least one of them to be true. So there, so, you know, so it could be this one, it could be, you know, this can be true or that can be true in, in order for the whole thing to be true. Well, um, C++ has a way to do, to, to combine these, these, uh, these comparisons together. 
um, through through these operators for Boolean logic. And so we we can we can combine these together through and or 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 um, well, the not is doesn't combine together, but a, a not will do a negation of an of of an of an argument. And so, um, and so, what we have here is uh, is we can if we wanted to put an or in, we could just put in these uh, these two vertical lines here, these characters for vertical lines, and then we can um, and then we'll have uh, we'll have uh, we can we can evaluate both of these things together. So, um, so now I'm going to say, is this true or that true? And so is this whole thing going to be true or false in this case? Well, uh, just given the logic that I, that I said, um, this whole thing should be, should be true because one of them is true, but even though the other is not, one of them, one of them is true. And so, um, and so that's, that's, that, that will make the whole thing be, be true. And so um, we should note that logical or will evaluate the true if, if either operand, the thing that's on either side is going to be true. Now we compare that with uh, with an and, and so the logical and, on, we'll do we'll do um, we'll do something a bit different in that it will evaluate the false if either operand is false. So if we took the same same uh, same condition here, so one's true and one's false, uh, and if we if we ask whether this is true or false, uh, with the and it, the whole thing will be false because not all of them are true. It has to be this and that have to be true in order for it to, to be evaluated uh, as true. And so all of this sits within, uh, within what's called Boolean logic. And so it was, came up with, uh, it was introduced by George Boole. Um, that's why we call it Boolean. I always, when I learned programming, I was like, what does Boolean come from? What does that mean? And so I just wanted to put George Boole here so you know where that, where that came from. And so what we're showing here are truth tables. So truth tables basically say, if you have, you know, if you have an ant, so if we take, or I'm going to annotate here. Um, so if uh, if we have uh, if we if we're having an and, and then the first thing on on one side, right here is false, and this other thing is false, then both of then the and will make them both false together, right? And so that's basically saying if um, if A is false and B is false, then A and B are false. <laughs> um, Similarly, if, uh, if we have, if A is true and B is false, then the whole, then A and B will be considered to be false. Um, the only time the and will be, will be true is if, if, our, if uh, first operand is true, if A is true and B is true, then the whole thing will be, then, the, then A and B will be considered to be true. And we can uh, we can compare that with uh, so if we look at all the all the options that we that we get here um, that we'll see that 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 uh, that, that um, then in order for the and to be true both our both operands have to be true and consider and similarly with our or the only time that we'll evaluate false is when both operands are false and then for our, our logical not the only thing it does is just flips the it flips it so if you give it something that's false it makes it true. To get something true that makes it false. All right, and so these are these are the ways that we do comparisons within if statements. And so we these operators are the operators we use for for within an if statement to do to to generate the types of um, to 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 to, uh, to evaluate the current condition of our program and decide where we're, if we're going to branch or if we're not going to branch at an if statement. We should note that these sit within our, our greater set our greater set of uh, of operators, and so operators have a precedence. And so, uh, so typically, so so I'm just have this rough order here, but uh, but you know, but there, but that order is. I mean, the ordering is is solid. So there, so that is the precedence. But this is not all the operators, I should say. And so we have grouping operators for commenting and parentheses. Um, we have our arithmetic operators, our comparisons. Uh, are, are, are below that, and then we have assignment operators. And so this is what we need to do in order to, to do branching and also make our programs uh, artificially intelligent. But the question is, is an if statement really AI? I mean, is that, is that really true? Is this, is this really all there is to AI? Um, is, is AI, is any AI anything more than, than, uh, than a bunch of if statements? Um, and, you know, the answer to that can be, uh, you know, people can have many different opinions on that. So, 
So I just looked on Quora um, and, you know, and you get a lot of different answers. You know, if you look on the internet or you just have, you just even talk with people about this, right? You just bring it up in conversation. You will get lots of different opinions. Um, and so, so I just put a, put a few out here that I thought were, were interesting. As a roboticist, uh, I, 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 it typically looks like, like this to me. I think this, this cartoon says, it says a lot. Um, and that you have, uh, you have this, uh, this, this person right here that developed a new robot. And they say, take a look at our brand new uh, robots full of artificial intelligence. You won't believe how intelligent it is. You're really selling their work and talking about how great it is and, and building a bunch of hype. And so, uh, so, you know, and so like, like engineers do, uh, they, they, you know, they start, you know, there's, they start saying, well, is this really AI inside? Is this based on a neural approach or starting to break it down? And then the salesperson's like, yes, yes, exactly. There's complex algorithms and, and saying things you can trust me, right? You should, by the way, you should never trust anybody who says that, but you like, but, um, but like an engineer would do on our third panel, you know, you know, dissects it, gets inside with, you know, with maybe, you know, unfortunately, some, sometimes the, the level of tact that, that people could show um, and just slashes into the robot and says, look what's inside. And, uh, and then inside, there's just a bunch of if statements. And so, so, so both, uh, both the engineers here are, uh, are not happy with the salesperson because it's just a bunch of if statements. Don't talk to me about AI, right? And so they're like, they're disappointed because where it's, what's, so, what's so special about this? It's just a, it's just a bunch of if statements. Um, but like, but to be honest, I think, I think if I looked at all three characters inside of this, I think all of them are, are wrong. The salesman's wrong for, for overhyping and, and not being honest about what, 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 uh, what's in there. And the engineers are just like, well, it's just, you know, it's just a bunch of if statements. What, what's so special about that? But maybe that, maybe that is, but, um, but the question, but then this leads to the question of, well, what are we, you know, what are, are we if statements, you know, how do we describe our, our, our behavior? How do we describe what we do? What are we, um, what is intelligence? And so this is, you know, and so, you know, this will, this will take you down, you know, all sorts of philosophical discussions about determinism and free will and all sorts of things that, that, to talk about what the nature of intelligence is. And so could you really define AI without, with, without defining intelligence? And so people like to talk about whether something is a, is a true AI or not AI. You know, I, th I think uh, in the end for this class, I'm gonna say uh, that's a great philosophical discussion. Uh, let's, save it for, for, let's save it for another time over coffee or, or, or something like that. Um, because, you know, because in the end, we're just really trying to build programs that can do things for us autonomously. Whether something is intelligent or not intelligent is a larger philosophical discussion. But there are people that have done both um, who are probably uh, smarter than I am. And so if I think about uh, Descartes, um, you know, Descartes, uh, who, you know, who, who brought us Cartesian coordinates and, and did great things for analytical geometry, um, you know, in his, uh, but also in his, um, in his writings, such as uh, Discourse on the Method, um, also had, had, you know, deep philosophical things to say as well, um, such as, I think, therefore I am, which is talked about the nature of, of, of existence, um, which has, you know, which, which is the foundation for, for a lot of, you know, uh, you know, uh, philosophical ideas on, on, on our existence and what is intelligence. Um, this was later refined uh, um, to say, well, not, it's not that I think, therefore I am. Uh, what Descartes was saying was, I doubt, and because I doubt, it means I'm thinking, and because I'm thinking, therefore I exist. And so, uh, and so, you know, all right, you know, cool. Let, let me just take that. I'm not going to get into the philo philo philosophy about it, but let's just take that and go back to our uh, to our C++ program and say, well, if this is what Descartes was really thinking, our program isn't, you know, it works, but it's not quite right because because we have no notion of doubt in our in our in our if statement here. So let's let's assume that uh, that I have to add something a bit more, um, and let's say and so just as an example of how to make a how to do a compound if statement, um, I'm gonna I know that I need to have doubt in my if statement, right? And so so I'm gonna add I'm adding doubt in, into this, um, and I know that my doubt has to be you know I have to have some doubt you know I have to have non-zero doubt. So let's say 
that my doubt is now greater than zero. I have to have doubt greater than zero. And in order for us to, for, to, for us to assert this statement, for our program to assert this statement about its existence, um, we know that both of these things have to be true. It has to have doubt and it has to be thinking. And so, um, so we're gonna, we're gonna add those together and we run our program, it works. So if I have, so if I have, if I have doubt and I'm thinking and both of those are greater than zero, then, uh, then my program works. Um, but let's suppose that I have cases that I'm not thinking about. Maybe this doesn't apply to everybody. Everybody is either they, you know, either they exist or they, they don't exist based off of their doubt or how much they think. Let's say that there's another case that we should consider. So for instance, um, you know, what if I, what if there was another case where, where you have somebody who, you know, who exists, but doesn't have doubt and, and we can handle that case with an else if statement. So let's say that, um, that what, that in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to say, if somebody has doubt, they can assert that they exist. If they don't have doubt and, and, and then we go, then we come to this else if statement. We, it's another condition that we can add to say they don't have doubt. So we're going to move on to the next statement. And then, um, then we're going to ask, well, is this person thinking? Is there, are they thinking? And so, um, and so they can now, they, if that's true, then we can output, I am somebody without doubt. And if, and if neither of those is true, if, if we get to that and there's no truth, then our, our default case, our else, we'll just say, don't worry, be happy. And so this really, so we can have this else if statement that we can put within our clauses and we can have any number of these. So we can have ifs and then any number of else ifs and then an, then an else. If we wanted to think about how these behave, we can, uh, we can break them out. So we wanna look at the overall, uh, overall uh, behavior of our, of our system. We can sort of consider each of, these, each of these, uh, these decision points, each of these branches and the actions that come out and we can form them into what's called a decision tree. So, so basically this shows sort of the, the execution of our, of, our, of our system. So if we come in, our, 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 um, our, we, we ask ourselves first, do we have, you know, is, is doubt greater than zero? If so, then we're going to just output, therefore I am to the terminal. If not, we're going to then ask another question. Is, uh, is thinking amount greater than zero? If so, then we're going to output, I am someone without doubts. If not, then we're just going to say, don't worry, be happy. So this describes the behavior of program as a, as a, as a graph, as another type of graph structure. We should note that we can, pro we can do this program in another way as well. So we're not restricted to just this, uh, to just this, um, this, you know, to, to just our, our if, else if, and, and then an else. Um, we can also nest, nest if statements inside of each other. So what we can say, so we can get the same behavior if we say, well, let's first ask if we have doubt. And if so, then we're going to, we're going to then output therefore I am. But if not, then in our else statement, we can include an if, an if else as well. And so, um, so what we're going to do here is then is that inside of that we can we can nest if statements inside of inside of other uh, if else if or else statements. And so in this case, we're just going to put this here. And so inside of that else, we'll then do another question about another branch about how much we're thinking, and that will decide where where we want to go. So we can put these inside of each other. And that allows us to, to express more and more complicated types of decision trees. And we should note that our pocket calculators will branch for different types of, uh, for, for different types of, of operations. And this is what our calculator needs to do. We need to use if statements to do this. So if we come back to our, our previous calculator, our previous calculator didn't branch, it just output all of the results to the, um, all the results to the, to the screen. Uh, we want our we want our branch to consider just the just the operation that that we that we'd like. And so in this case, what we're going to do is if we look at our old pocket calculator, this is the finite state machine we have. Get we get two numbers, perform the operations, we output the results, and then we and then we end the program. But what we're going to do instead, and so I'm moving to now version 46, is we're going to change this and that we're going to first make sure that we get an operator. And using that operator, we're going to then go to uh, inside of our perform operation function. We're going to change this now perform operation. We're going to change this such that we that we um, 
this perform operation such that it's not, we're not re returning the sum, the difference, the product and the quotient. We're only returning the, the result. And because we're, because we're going to select that and we're going to select that uh, the, the appropriate, uh, the appropriate um, operation to perform. And then similarly, when we output result, we're only going to have to output both operands, the operator and the, and the result number. This means that we have to go inside of our, inside of our perform operation function. Well, this is just showing that, that if we do this the right way, we'll, uh, we'll now, we'll now get the operator and we'll, and we'll, it will do the right operation. But in order for this to work, uh, we have to go inside of our, inside of our, our perform operation function and we have to add branching. And so that means that we have to ask what function, how do we phrase our function arguments that are coming in? And then once we have those arguments to come in, what would, how can we, how can we express the logic in C++ such that if the operation is addition, that, that what we return, that what the val, that, that what we, what we store in the result will be the sum. Else, if the operation is a subtraction, then we want to, we want to store the difference as the result. Else, if the operation is a multiplication, we want to store the product of those two numbers as the result. Else, if the, um, the operation is division, then we want to store the quotient as the result. And so, and so by doing that, by branching inside of this, uh, inside of this function, we can, we can do the right thing in terms of our, uh, in terms of just applying the right operation. One thing that we should also note is that, um, is that there's some operations that can introduce errors into our system. And so for instance, if we're trying to divide two numbers and let's say that operand two in this case, which is gonna be in the denominator um, is gonna be zero. Well, that zero will be, will be not good and that will, that will introduce an error. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we catch that. So if the operand, if, if we divide by zero here in this function divide two numbers, well, we wanna, we wanna say that lack of introduce an error. So we wanna print it inside of this function. We wanna make sure that we print an error message and then we exit the program. And you can exit, the, I can exit any C program. Um, if, you, if you have the statement exit and then you can put in whatever, whatever value you wanna have in there uh, the, that's usually re resembles and uh, represents an error code. Um, and then that, that error statement, that exit statement will then, will then terminate the program right there. So the question then is is uh, is basically how when should our calculator stop? Not just that uh, not just that um, that uh, that you know that if we're if that our pocket calculator is going to continue continue over and over and over, over again, um, you know it's it's going to perform infinitely, but it should stop at some point maybe. Um, and so really, this pocket calculator should stop at least our pocket calculator stop when we tell it to. And that is really important. And that gets to our sort of the next, com, com, the next thing that we're gonna talk about uh, that will be on top of branching, which is iteration. And so let's go back and, and, and see what our, what, our, what our calculator is doing thus far and get a sense of what we want it to do. So, so once we, so if we're, if we're looking at our, our calculator right now, um, the current calculator, it's gonna, it's gonna do this. It's gonna get a number and then we're going to get an, get an operation then we're going to get a number. We're going to perform that operation. That's going to store a result. Then we're going to output that result. And then our program is going to end. And that's it. So that's what calculator 46 does, right? Um, but that's not really what our pocket calculator does. Our pocket calculator doesn't, doesn't exit here. Our pocket calculator, as we've shown before, loops back. So it doesn't end program. After it outputs the result, it comes back and gets the next operator. And so in this case, we'll get the addition operator. And then from there, we can enter another number. So we're gonna, in this case, get an eight. We're gonna perform that operation. Note that we're doing it on the result of the last operation, which is 12. So 12 plus eight will be 20. And we're outputting the whole thing. We're just sort of our, it's just sort of what we've had up to this point onto the, onto the screen. Um, and so when we're outputting that, that result, then we can come back and we can, uh, we're going to loop, loop back for the, for the next calculation iteration. Um, and so now we're going to get a new operator, which is going to be subtraction. We're going to type a number into the screen. Um, we're going to perform that operation and then we're going to output the result and then we're going to continue. 
we loop back again. We do another calculation iteration, this time dividing by five, which will result in a two. Then we take that two, we build on it again. So this time we're gonna multiply by 51. That gives us 102. And then at some point the user might say, you know, might have in, in our, in our um, might have in our, uh, might, might at our command line. Notice we have Q here as one of our, one of our operators now, one of the commands that the, that the user can give. The user says, now I wanna quit and I wanna give a Q. Um, and so now from that get operator state, we could go, we can then go to an end program state if the operator is Q. Um, and so in order to do this, we, that's the kind of behavior we'd like to see. Um, how, do we, how do we do this looping and see what, what's the way to do this? We've studied branching, but now how do I iterate over, over a loop? Well, one option to do this is, like, is, going, to be an, uh, is going to be a while loop. And so while is gonna be very much like, like, uh, like an if. Um, and so if we, so we can simply, uh, so in this case, if we wanna do a while loop, we can simply change that if statement into a while, in, into while. so we change if to while. And now, our pro, and now if we run our program, we're gonna get, you know, this, this is just gonna continually say, uh, therefore I, I am, it's gonna repeat this, this block over and over and over. It's gonna complete it forever. Um, <laughs> it'll just keep going and going and going. Um, and so what, what we call this is we call it an infinite loop because the while loop will just continue over and over and it will never stop. And, um, and so it will just compete, complete infinitely until we break in to interrupt it. So, so if you, if you ever get in this case where you're on the command, where you're on the, at the terminal and programs just gone out of control and, and we don't, and it's just gone off and it's not, it's, um, it's never going to, it's not going to terminate uh, or come back to give you input. Um, you can always press control and C together. So you press control and key C's together and that will interrupt and terminate the program. Um, so why did this while loop do this? Well, our while, let's talk about what the while structure looks like. So inside the while, so, so similar to, uh, to, uh, to our if, our while, our loop statement begins with the word while and it has, it's followed by a condition that's inside of parentheses. And that condition will evaluate to either true or false. If that condition is true, what we will do is then execute the next block of code, the block of code inside of the, the, brace, the braces. And then after we've done, if we're done executing that block of code, we're gonna come back up and we're gonna reevaluate the loop condition. If that loop condition is true, we're gonna continue to, um, we're gonna continue to, to, we're gonna, if the loop condition is true, then we'll, then we'll execute the, the block of code again. Then we'll come back up and evaluate the loop condition and do that over and over and over until the loop condition turns false. So if the loop condition is false, then we leave the loop and we skip the next block of code and we start and we, um, and we continue with the execution after uh, with the next statement, very similar to our if statement. So you could think of our while as the same thing as our if, except that we don't execute the, we don't just execute the, the block of code once, we keep doing it until the condition turns false. So with this, Suppose we, you know, we, we decreased our thinking after every iteration. So let's say we did want this infinite loop. Let's say that what we did instead was we, um, that every, every time we iterated, so, so we added a, a line that says the amount that we're thinking decreases by one every time we, every, every time we, uh, we, we go through an iteration. And so if we did that, you know, when we ran, we would get, you know, we would only get, it would only say, therefore I am one time. This was for our, for our, our program here. We could do this similarly, uh, instead of just saying thinking amount equals thinking amount minus one, make that assignment to just decrease that variable by one. We could alternatively use uh, what's called a decrement operator. And so that's the name of the variable with two dashes behind it. And, um, and that will essentially Assign, that will essentially subtract one from an integer variable. Note that this sits with inside of this sits inside of our uh, inside of our um, inside of our uh, this sits in the space of our of our operator. So we, in addition to decrementing, we can increment, which will add a variable, uh, which will add um, which will add one to a variable, and so we'll, we can use both of those. Um, and so this this sits in our in our in our precedence. So if we come back and now I now I, I use this decrement operator, um, I get the same result. Great, that's that's awesome. 
now suppose that we had more thought at the beginning. And so let's say that we didn't just, we just didn't just have one for our thinking amount. Um, now we had, now instead we had three. Um, and so, uh, and so this thinking amount, so now if I ran this with three being the, 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 the assignment of thinking amount at the start, now I'm gonna get, uh, now our loop is gonna iterate three times and I'm gonna get, uh, I'll, I'll get the, my, my code will, 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 um, will produce three, three um, will print out therefore I am three times. Um, to get a sense of what this does, just to make sure we, we have a sense of what this looks like, um, let's walk through each step so we can see what's going on. So when we start our program, our, uh, our program will start here at, 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 um, with, uh, with the declaration and assignment of thinking amount. Um, at that point, once we run that piece, once, once we run that, we'll then have a variable called thinking amount, which will have three in it. I'm gonna use this, uh, this, this region up here to describe, to, to show what, what variables look like in our program in memory at the current time. So once we get to the, so, Next, we get to this while loop and we're gonna evaluate the, 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 um, the continuation condition. And so when we look at this, so we evaluate the condition and the condition is basically saying, well, is the value of thinking amount, which is three, is that greater than zero? Well, that will be, that will be true. And because it's true, we're gonna execute uh, the, this next block of code. So now we're gonna go down and we're, and we're gonna continue and say, all right, this is, uh, we're gonna print out, therefore I am, and so we'll, that will go out to the screen. And then we're gonna subtract one from thinking amount. And then we're gonna go back, then we're gonna, end, then we're gonna be at the end of the, of the iteration. We're gonna be at the end of the, the block of code. So now what we're gonna do is our iteration is done. We're gonna go back to the loop start. Once we're at the loop start, we're gonna look at the loop condition again and say, is, uh, is the, the current value of thinking amount, which is two, is that greater than zero? And that is true. So we're going to continue in our program execution and, and, and within us inside of our loop again. We're going to again print out another therefore I am. We're going to then decrement thinking amount. So that will now become one. And then our iteration is done. We're going to go back to the loop start. Again, we're going to then now look at, at whether our condition is true. Thinking amount is one, which is greater than zero. So now we're going to go inside of our loop again. Um, and then we can, we're gonna print out our next line. We're gonna decrement our thinking amount variable. And now we're gonna go back to start. Now at this point, the value of thinking amount is no longer greater than zero. It's equal to zero, but it's not greater than zero. And so that false will then, will then, will then, uh, will then have us exit, exit the loop. And so when we, ex when, we, when we exit the loop, then there's no more statements for us to, to, to execute on a program. So then our program will then, will then end. And this will produce the, this produces the behavior that we're seeing. And so that's what our while loop is going to do. And so, um, and so while loops are, are great. So this is, this is something we can do. We, in the same way that we can have if statements with various types of conditions, our while loop can have this as, as well. And so the while loop is one option, but, but there's also other options that we could use too. And so another one of those is, is called a, a for loop. And so that's another option. And to understand what a for loop does, let's go back to our while loop and just understand, let's analyze it to see what it, what it does. And, you know, and that will help us, you know, that, or a typical while loop, and that will help us understand what a for loop will, can do for us. And so if we come back and we think about the elements of one of these typical iteration loops that we have here. Um, there's a, there's a number of elements that are, that are usually sort of common and, and we, can, we can make more, more general. So the first element that I'd like to think about is an iterator variable. So our iterator variable is gonna be the variable that we're tracking. The, the, it will, the condition of the, of the loop, the, the, the continuation condition is gonna depend on the value of that, that iterator variable. Um, that iterator variable will be initialized to some value. So in this case, in, in the case of our, our previous program, that the, val the iterator is initialized to three. There will, all, there will be a continuation condition, which will say, based off the current, the current value of the iterator variable, should the, should the loop continue or not? And so that's what we're gonna evaluate every time. And then there's also gonna be an iterator update. That iterator update will say, how the iterator value should, the, how the value of the iterator should change from one, from one loop, from one iteration of the loop to, to the next. 
Um, and so usually we don't use thinking amount as our, as our iterator variable because you're going to use this iterator variable uh, you know, many times. So we usually use something a bit shorter. So I is going to be a common name for an iterator variable. So we're going to we just use I in this case. Um, and if we did this, this, these basic components are what sit inside of, a, inside of a for loop. So our for loop is going to have the same basic structure where we're going to have an iterator variable, which is going to be declared, which is declared up here. And then when our for loop, our for loop has three sections uh, that are spaced, that are spaced out by, by semicolons. And so the first, the first part of the, the for loop is going in, that's inside of these, these parentheses here um, is going to be our, uh, I'm going to take that away, is going to be our, our initialization. So we're going to say we have an iterator variable i, it will equal to three. And then we have a semicolon, and then we say, then we say our, what our stopping condition is. We're going to continue this loop until i is greater than zero. And then we have a semicolon and we say what our iterator update should be. And then we're going to say we're going to decrease our iterator by one every time we go through the loop. And so this will have, this will work for us. This will essentially do the same thing that, that, uh, that, uh, that our while loop did previously. And so if we ran this code, we still get the correct output and it, and it looks great. All right. So now if we, if we think about our two options, so we have two options here, we have a for loop and a while loop, which roughly have these structures. Um, which is the right one for our, for our calculator. Um, so if we're thinking about our calculator where we, where, where it's going to continue until we, until we give it a quit, until we give it this cue, um, which one, which one's the right one? Well, if we use our for loop, we've got to specify, you know, roughly we're going to have to specify how many iterations we have. If, our, if we initialize our iterator variable to three, um, we can, um, we can make our, you know, we, we're going to, it's going to decrement down and it's going to continue to go until, until we, in, until the stopping condition. And we could do that. Um, but what if, but, you know, but we don't necessarily know how many, how many operators, um, any operations the user is going to request of us. Um, if we use the while loop instead, what we can do is we don't have to specify necessarily what the, what the, um, what, you know, how many iterations we could just make our condition be, be well. Wait until the, we could we could have a, our our stopping condition, our continuation condition can be dependent on what the operator is telling us. So we're going to continue infinitely until the user tells us to stop. So I'm going to make the argument. I mean, you can make arguments both ways, but I'm going to make the argument for the while loop, and uh, I'm going to just roughly show you what I what I did. So this is this is calculator 54 that I have, version 54, the condensed version. I the the actual version I wrote is much lar larger. But let me walk through it and show you what, what, what I would do in the while loop here. So the first thing, I'm going to highlight it in, into the, with, in what our finite state machine does right here. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get a number. And when I get a number, I'm, let's say I get three, three from, the, from the user. Then I'm going to get an operator. And the operator is going to say, let's say I get, a, I get multiply, following our example. Our while loop is going to say, is, going to, is now going to branch and say, do I, do I go and get another number? Do I continue on a loop and get a, another number? Or do I, or did I get a Q? Is my current operator Q at, at that point that I quit? Well, we got, we didn't get the Q, we got the multiply. So we're going to continue inside of the loop. And so we're going to now get another number. We're going to then, uh, and we get a four. We're going to perform that operation, which will be a 12. Three times four is 12. We're going to output the result to the terminal. We're going to then um, make sure, so we so noting again that the result, whatever our result is, it becomes the first operand for the um, for the next operation. So so when I loop, so getting so so this is going to be this is going to do my update for the next iteration. It's going to get my my my. It's going to uh, it's going to move my result to being the first operand, and so that's what this statement here is doing. We're going to come back and get the get the next operator, and so once we get that operator. We can then decide. All right, so we can then decide whether we're gonna how we're gonna branch. And so let's say that the the user now gives us a queue. If the user gives us a queue, then we know that, that we're not going to get another number. We're gonna exit the loop, and instead we're gonna end the program and we're gonna continue out. And so this is the basic flow of my calculator uh, 54. And so when I run this, this is this is what I get. This is this is the the, the trace. Looks great. 
And, uh, and really, if we if we've done this, we've we now can we have now covered branching and iteration, we can make a calculator do the do the right things. And so, so this is so this pocket, this calculator that we have now is doing the things that are that a regular calculator would do, you should note that I, I, I output the whole the whole set of things, uh, you know, so if you're looking at the at the output, I, I'm every time an operation is done, I keep the sort of history of that, you know, um, but I didn't really tell you how to do that. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and, um, and so, you know, and, you know, it's really very hacky. So one, one way that our current calculator is different than a regular calculator is that it doesn't show this long history of things you've done in the past. It only shows the current result. Um, and so this gets to some things that we want to maybe introduce that we could do better. And we're going to talk about this next time for, for how we could use vectors, structs, and file IO. And uh, there's a number of things that we want to consider. Can we keep a history of our operations? Um, can we undo the last operation? And if you're paying any attention, you know, you're looking at, the, at what I'm outputting, you're like, this does not look right. We've just talked about the order of operations and that, that is not a proper mathematical expression. So that doesn't look right. And what we like to do next time is make it look right. And so we're gonna, we're gonna do that the, the right way. Um, and so, so with that, I'm going to I'm going to stop here. Um, thank you very much, and uh, looking forward to uh, to seeing your calculators and getting us working and doing some some initial servoing, uh, some writing some servo code that's based off of off of branching and iteration in the uh, in, in 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 our in our lab. All right, thank you. <laughs>